Starting with Bart vs the Space Mutants, Acclaim was all in on churning out Simpsons games as fast as they could. Bart vs the Space Mutants was a success, and after its initial release in April 1991, they were straight to work porting it to anything and everything. Gary Kitchen, the director of the game, has spoken about how time crunched they were to finish it, leaving it in an unpolished state, but that didn't stop Acclaim and Imagineering getting straight to work on the next two games, Bart Simpsons Escape from Camp Deadly and Bart vs the World. We'll be looking at Bart vs the World in the next video, as Escape from Camp Deadly came out first in November 1991, only 7 months after Bart vs the Space Mutants. I'm surprised that they didn't take Bart vs the Space Mutants and port that to the Game Boy alongside everything else. I actually kind of appreciate them making something original just for the handheld. The Game Gear was also a handheld, and that did get Bart vs the Space Mutants, and if I had to throw out a guess to why, I think it's because the first level heavily revolves around finding purple objects, and the Game Gear was in colour, where the original Game Boy was not, so you wouldn't be able to tell what the purple objects were. The Game Boy was a huge success at the time as well, so I can see why they would want to make something original for it, make a game to try and appeal to that huge audience that it had. This is the first Simpsons game on the list that I've never played. Honestly, before starting to research these games for this series, I had no idea it even existed. The Game Boy had a few one-off Simpsons games during this era, and with them being original titles that lacked the same notoriety as the console and PC games, they seemed to be mostly forgotten and only known to the hardcore fans. With this being the same team as Barthes of the Space Mutants, and the development time being so short, I'm not hopeful for this one. I'll be happy if I can beat this without turning on any cheats. A pretty low bar I know, but that's just how it is with games made by Imagineering. It's a pretty underwhelming title screen. Of course this is the Game Boy, but there's no music or animation, instead we have some awkward images of Bart and Lisa, with them both kind of smiling, and Lisa staring off into space. Pushing Star takes us to the opening cutscene, explaining the story where Bart and Lisa have been sent to Camp Deadly for the summer, which is ran by Iron Fist Burns. This isn't Mr. Burns, this is a new character who is his nephew. It's a bit weird that it's his nephew and not his son, but I guess the idea of Mr. Burns having a son would have been a bit too far-fetched. Oh wait. The story is brief, Iron Fist Burns unsurprisingly runs the camp with, well, an Iron Fist, meaning Bart and Lisa want to escape. It's hard not to mention this plot without bringing up how similar it is to the Season 4 episode Camp Krusty, an episode that came out after this game released. You can try and link these together somehow, but it feels like a big coincidence to me, especially as Camp Krusty was originally pitched as an idea for a Simpsons film. Seems unlikely they stole the idea from this game to pitch it as a potential film. It's more likely that it's just a fairly generic idea that both teams just stumbled on, in my opinion. Escape from Camp Deadly is a platformer, which is based on Barthes of the Space Mutants with some key differences. A lot has been stripped back controls wise, so no item system, no run button, and no pressing two buttons at the same time to do a high jump. You have one type of jump, and you can throw your weapon, or if you don't have one, you spit wad to stun enemies. Climbing has also been added, where you can press up or jump onto certain trees, rocks or vines to climb upwards. It's still quite slow and heavy like Space Mutants was, but it feels much better overall. The platforming has been improved, as what platforms are, are now much clearer due to the simplified graphics on the Game Boy. It's also more generous when trying to land on a platform. Platforms can look quite small, sure, but they do stretch out further than they look, so if it looks like you only just make a jump, you'll normally make it quite easily without the need for too much precision or timing. Platforming is mostly solid, most of the time it's done over bottomless pits which I don't normally like, but the jumps themselves aren't too bad. Apart from this one time in the second half of the game, where you have to jump quickly between falling platforms. I died more to these than anything else in the game. The spacing between the platforms is pretty awkward, and with these heavy controls, it was hard to judge my jumps. Still, it's a big improvement overall. Removing the super jump in itself helps a lot. Outside of the platforming, there's quite a lot of combat in this game. There are sections dedicated to you taking out large groups of enemies that spawn in from off screen. Enemies mostly don't have attacks, it's more if you touch them, you take damage. To take care of enemies, you have to hit them with your boomerang, which is an item you can find from Lisa at numerous times throughout the game. Boomerangs take out enemies, but you can only throw one at a time, so while your boomerang is still in the air, you can press B to stun enemies with the spitwad. I'm quite split over the enemies in this game. Initially when you first play, they are frustrating to deal with. 
Bart's sprite is pretty big on the screen, so there's not much space on the screen for you and the enemies that spawn in. Very early on you encounter enemies that spawn off screen randomly and charge at you, and surviving these sections while you're still trying to figure out the controls is pretty rough. The first enemy in the game you can't kill initially as you don't get the boomerang until afterwards, so just like in Space Mutants, you may die to the first enemy of the game. Once the movement starts clicking and you get a good sense of how the enemies spawn in, it can actually be pretty fun and, dare I say, engaging going through these sections. Depending on the level you're playing, enemies can jump, fall from the top of the screen, or throw apples and cutlery at you. As you play and learn the game, you figure out where these enemies appear and how they spawned in, and it allows you to figure out a way to counter them. It doesn't stop it from being annoying initially, but when you have a good run, dodging enemies, ducking at the right time, or dodging a boomerang that's coming back at you so it kills a different enemy, it can feel really cool. I felt like a ninja at times playing this game. You really get in the zone, which feels like a weird thing to say for a kind of clunky Game Boy platformer. I can't fully defend the combat, mostly because it is a bit random. Certain enemies will always spawn in the exact same way every time, allowing you to memorise their locations and counter those, but many times when the enemies spawn in and dogpile you, their spawning is random. I can see why they're random, to keep you on your toes, but it means you can take damage due to bad luck, and that doesn't feel great. The random enemy spawning also has a negative knock-on to the new health system. You start off with two hits per life, but now you can collect donuts, which gives you extra hits. I had no idea these were donuts. I only know they are that because I read it in the manual. Most of the donuts you get are from specific enemies, which are darker than the rest. If you take them out, they drop a donut, which you can then go and pick up. Having a proper health system helps this game massively. While you may take a lot of hits due to the way the enemies spawn in, you can also build back your health by killing these darker enemies. You can still quite easily die, but once you get used to all of this, and you're dodging enemies more while still getting health pickups, you can finish combat sections with more health than what you started with, and that's satisfying. Saying that, if you die due to an instant death pit, you lose all the donuts that you built up, and you're back to two hits. It doesn't help that at the very beginning of the game, there are these bees that move in patterns that feel a bit random, and touching them is an instant kill. It's completely unnecessary to have instant kill enemies so early on, but this is Imagineering, old habits die hard, they couldn't help themselves but have something that's overly harsh at the beginning of this game. The random enemy spawning also applies to the enemies that have health pickups, so you can go a whole section and not see one, or get lucky and see three at once. It would have been nice if this was a bit more consistent. Overall though, the health system is another big improvement. A system where you can increase your max health might have felt a little bit better, but still, a step in the right direction. There are separate levels in the game, but they all blend into each other to give a better sense of Bart travelling through the camp to escape. Each level starts with a billboard which explains the camp activity that you'll be taking part in for that level. The first one is flag capture, where you have to go through the woods and pick up any flags you come across to progress forward. I quite like this level. The main problem is that I don't think it's a great introduction to get people into the game, as I mentioned there's instant kill bees and the enemy spawning. As you go through the level you come across a river and you can't jump across. Instead you have to climb up the tree to go into a secret tree house and inside is a mini boss called Blindside Bill. There's a few of these buddy bosses where you have to defeat them with a the boomerang in a specific way. Hitting them directly doesn't do anything, so you have to hit them in just the right way to take them out. Their name gives you a clue to how to do this, so with Blindside Bill you have to try and hit him from behind to take him out. These fights are pretty annoying to begin with. If you don't figure out how to line up the boomerang, the bully just charges you, and if they get too close it's hard to get away and you'll likely die. There's a bottomless pit on one side that kills you, so you can't escape once you enter the treehouse, which is bad because it's possible to run out of boomerangs, and if that happens you may just have to game over. There is a trick to them though, you can throw the boomerang upwards at an angle, and it kills all the bullies in the same way without any need for real strategy. The boomerang is kind of strange. You don't directly aim it with the d-pad. Instead, if you're on the ground, it will always go straight forward, and the angle changes depending on your jump. If you throw the boomerang at the beginning of a jump while going up, you'll throw it diagonally upwards. If you throw it at the top of a jump, it'll go straight ahead, and if you throw it when you're coming back down to the ground, it goes diagonally downwards. Once I realised this is how the boomerang worked, it controls okay, but it's pretty confusing at first. It's something else that can make this game off-putting at the beginning. Dealing with these bullies, the heavy controls, the instant kill bees, and the enemy spawning do mean there's a barrier for entry here. 
If you play this for about 5 minutes and then drop it, it may leave a bad taste in your mouth. Defeating Blindside Bill gives you a beekeeper costume from Lisa, which you can use to run past bees without being harmed. I managed to find free costumes across the game, and I really like this idea, but there's not much to them. Each costume stops you from taking damage in different ways, but you can't use your boomerang while wearing them, which makes them a bit limited. They're only available for a short time for a specific section, and taking damage while wearing one can make you lose it straight away. They do their job well enough though, which is adding some variety to the levels. After the beekeeper costume, the other two are completely optional, so finding them, defeating the bullies, and getting the costume feels rewarding in itself. So after the woods, you head into the mess tent, which is a pure combat section, where you have to pick up food and throw out enemies to get past. There's a limited number of food to pick up, and if you throw in front of a counselor, you have to eat all the food you're holding, taking away all your ammo. The mess tent is split into three parts, each having different food to throw, but if you have any food remaining when you reach the end of a section, you place it into the bins for points, and you get an extra donut for every five pieces of food you have. These were tough at first, and the first time you get here you'll likely get a game over, but the more you play the game, the more these sections start to click. Getting through the mess tent takes us back into the woods for more flag capture, only the enemies are a bit more aggressive and the platforming is a bit trickier. Halfway through you find a pipe with a nuclear symbol, so of course you jump right in, and you have to go through the sewers dodging whatever these are meant to be. The first time I reached the nuclear pipe was a really cool moment. This game is tough. I died many times before reaching this point, while I was learning the controls and the level design, and if you run out of lives and get a game over, you're back at the title screen and starting all over again. Not something I would normally like, but this game does find that balance between being punishing, but also being rewarding once you figure something out and make progress. Each time I played this game I got a little bit further, got a little bit better, or maybe I would find a secret that would be helpful for every subsequent playthrough. It meant that reaching such a different and unexpected setting, like a nuclear waste pipe, was such a great little moment, such a great way to reinforce progress. I might be oversetting this, but if you take the time to get over the initial hump, this game does tap into that old school difficulty where it can suck you in and even be fun. It's also cool figuring things out, like this weird guy hanging upside down in the woods. You can take him out with a boomerang because if you touch him it does damage, or you can jump around him on the trees and free him. Later in a boss fight with Nelson, he reappears and he can help you out so you can hit Nelson without any risk of being hit. A bit like the dog in Resident Evil 4, only 13 years earlier and on the Game Boy. It's nothing amazing, and these type of ideas were kind of in Bart vs the Space Mutants, but their simplicity and the more to the point nature of this game makes them more effective in being rewarding. This game definitely frustrated me, don't get me wrong, but I liked making progress on each run, that felt good to do. Speaking of frustrating me, you go in and out of pipes as you walk through the woods, and one of these pipes is filled with infinitely spawning spiders that fall from the ceiling and crawl along the ground. I got a game over here when I first reached this pipe as I couldn't figure out how to get past them. I waited and waited and waited for an opening but never saw one, and they just kept coming. Like a lot of this game, there's a trick here, and that's that the spiders will never go to the right, so if you go past the spiders, it won't come at you. A bit annoying, but after some careful jumping and boomerangs, you escape the sewers and are introduced to a new enemies, mosquitoes. They don't spawn randomly in, which is a plus, and you get a chance to take them out with the boomerang from a distance. It's a little slow doing this, aiming the boomerang can be tricky as you have to time it with your jumps, so I don't love these enemies, but it's a fine change of pace. Eventually you get to the end of the woods and reach Nelson. The person who we saved earlier is called Mad Mad Mort, and fighting Nelson without him can be tough. He runs along the top of the branch dropping apples, and you can't throw the boomerang upwards without jumping, but as your jump is higher than the branch he stands on, it's easy to jump into Nelson while doing this and take damage. Using Mad Mad Mort basically allows you to skip through this fight though, so it's not an issue. Beating Nelson takes us back to the mess tent for round 2 of the food fighting. Hard to defend the game repeating content like this, we've gone from the woods, to the mess tent, to the woods, to then the mess tent again, but once you get through this second round, it takes us to the second cutscene of the game. This is another cool moment! The story here isn't anything all that worthwhile, and there's not even really any jokes, but this feels like such a moment in this game. Finally making it through the woods, finally making it through the dinner halls, and getting a cutscene of all things. In the cutscene, Bart and Lisa decide that Camp Deadly is awful, and they want to escape, 
so they're going to climb Mount Deadly, which is an area that's off limits to them. This cutscene also marks about the halfway point of the game. Reaching here consistently means you're getting pretty good at the game. Mount Deadly itself is split into climbing rocks on the outside and going through dark caves. Not a fan of either of these sections. Climbing the rocks doesn't feel great, it's easy to slip off and get killed. And there are people throwing rocks at you and the window to dodge these rocks is tiny, it's so hard to do. Inside the caves you have these bats which are largely okay, but again, it's such a small window to dodge some of these, as Ba is so big on screen, so it makes it quite easy to take damage. Things start to get a bit weird in these caves, with these skulls falling from the ceiling and actual skeletons coming to life and attacking you. It's pretty surreal going from food fights to fighting off actual skeletons. Let's not think on what this means for what's really going on with Iron Fist Burns and Camp Deadly. I'm sure kids aren't climbing up this mountain, dying, and then coming to life due to all the nuclear waste. No, 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 I'm sure that's not it. Mount Deadly can be quite tough, but coming out the other side takes us back to the woods, only this time it's at night and we have completely different music. This is pretty much the final level, but this music is more odd and disjointed. With the skeletons from before and now this music and setting, the game has quite an intense vibe to it. It can feel tense, but that's also because you've come so far to get to this point and you don't want to mess it up and get a game over and start all over again. The final woods level is a bit of a gauntlet. It combines a lot of what we saw before in the woods, platforming over water, enemies flying at you and the mosquitoes. There's a couple of new things to help it feel a bit different. There's these large campfires to avoid, which is quite easy to do, and there are some sleeping bears. There are sticks everywhere on the ground near the bears, and I assume if you stand on the sticks you wake up the bears and die, but I never did that luckily. At the end of the woods is another nuclear pipe, and jumping in takes us to another sewer section, which is the hardest one yet, combining the nuclear things that fall down to avoid and the spiders. I got a game over my first time here, which is pretty rough to handle, as this is the final level of the game. It's not too bad once you get the timing down. Towards the end of the pipe there are these little panels above you which you can turn off using the boomerang and as you do this you see Lisa in a ball and chain. That's pretty grim but hitting every single panel turns out the light which causes Lisa to disappear and it allows you to jump over Iron Fist Burns and escape. After turning off an electrical generator you get this nice little moment of standing on the cliff with Lisa overlooking the camp as all the lights go off as you've now shut down the power. It's nice that you actually control Bart here. You can stare at this dark camp all you like, or you can jump up and down in victory. Once you're bored with that, going right beats the game, with one last screen showing Bart and Lisa reunited with the rest of the Simpsons family. It's not a great ending, and there's no unlockable sadly, but I wasn't expecting too much with this being a Game Boy game. Beating the game was kind of its own reward. It took me 11 attempts to get to the end, which might not sound like that many, but that was over 3 hours of playing the game, and honestly, finally having that run where I beat it and saw the ending felt good. Having another version of 8-Bit Marge is just the cherry on top. So that was Bart Simpson's Escape from Camp Deadly. I wasn't expecting much with this being from the same team as Bart vs the Space Mutants and it being on the Game Boy, but I found myself enjoying this one. When it comes to ranking it and saying whether it's a good game, I would say it's not a great game, but it is pretty good. It's basic, there's not a lot here to really compliment as it doesn't have a lot going on. It's a platformer which feels quite heavy and doesn't really separate it out from other games in the genre. It can be frustrating as well, the enemy spawning being random can put you in unfair situations and there's numerous things that instantly kill you and figuring things out isn't always that fun. However, I did really get sucked into it and I wanted to keep playing. I wanted to overcome its more frustrating parts to beat it. There's decent variety here with the level design as there's a good balance between combat platforming and finding secrets. It helps that this game isn't long. My successful run beating this game was just over half an hour, a great length for a Game Boy game like this. You can pick it up, see how far you get and either try again or put it down for later. The more simple nature of the challenge it presents makes it more engaging and while it lacks anything that makes it too unique or special, it's a solid little game. For is this something for Simpsons fans to enjoy? I don't think there's much here. Iron Fist Burns is a strange concept in itself, so that's kind of worth checking out, but the levels and enemies are all largely generic, so if you're a Simpsons fan, you're not missing out on much by skipping this one. I can see why it's forgotten. It doesn't have much to stand out as it's not amazing, but it's not awful either. It's mostly solid with a bit of frustration thrown in. 
Still, I did enjoy this game, which means I'm putting it at number 2 in the rankings. I like this game, but The Simpsons Arcade is still a bit more fun with better graphics and presentation, although I do think this game is better than The Simpsons for the Commodore 64. I was really charmed by that game at the time, but if I have to be honest with myself, the gameplay was weak, so I would prefer to play this game instead. And that's Bart Simpsons Escape from Camp Deadly added to the list. Thank you very much for watching, if you agree or disagree with me please let me know in the comments, and I'll see you next time for Bart vs the World. I hope it's much more like Camp Deadly, and much less like Space Mutants, but I'm not confident that's going to be the case.